Good morning. My name is Diane Newman, and uh, this workshop is on evidence-based and clinical application of urologic catheters. I have a fantastic um, speakers that will be speaking with me, um, and uh, they include Sharon Eustace, Howard Goldman, and Mary Wild. So we'll have a break in between. And so, do you, so you know the breaks, although the bathroom's right next to us, so it's easy. We're going to do two lectures. We will take questions after the two, then we break from 10.30 to 11, and then we'll have two more speakers, then we'll have questions at the end, okay? Uh, so this is kind of the layout of how we're gonna do the workshop. And it was in the handout, so it really hasn't diff uh, differed, except that the break changed as far as the time. What we wanna do is give you an overview of urologic catheters. So it's a nice mix of catheters we're using and also evidence based in this, this area, which is, as you'll hear from Sharon, isn't all that great. And then also um, what we use around surgery um, and then um, some evolving research that Mary's done on self-management. So those are the objectives, is to detail the current use of urologic catheters used for incontinence and retention, differentiate the various catheterization techniques, indications, complications, and management, to understand the perioperative use of catheters for incontinence surgery with a discussion of protocols for discontinuing catheters. That's a really big thing in the U.S. There's a real um, disincentive financially for the use of indwelling catheters, especially in hospitals. To describe self-management techniques and the quality of life burden of patients with urinary catheters. And then to present evidence-based guidelines on the use of urinary catheters, especially in relation to catheter-associated UTIs. So let's start with, I'm gonna go through all the catheters and just give you like a brief overview of exactly, um, you know, the different types that are used. I, by the way, here's all my um, conflicts. I, I, I deal with catheters every day in my practice, whether it be an external, internal, indwelling, a lot of indwelling because of, um, we're part of the health system in Philadelphia. So I deal with this all the time. Um, I cannot tell you how many men post prostatectomy who cannot deal with the incontinence, who by the time they see me has found some type of catheter. I just saw one last week who found it in, um, I don't know what medical supplier, and had it on with tape again. And I said, no, you can't do that. I said, they, you have to throw them out after one day. And he, because no one told him about it, and, and this is my center, which is probably one of the top urology centers in the U.S., and he said, well, it fell off, so I had to keep it on. So the issue is there's a lot of um, thing, there's a lot of education that's not being done in this area. So let's talk about indwelling. So an indwelling is a closed sterile system. It allows for continual drainage, searching of a flexible tube in the bladder. It's either done urethrally or suprapubically, or it could be a conduit. So it could be a stoma, catheterizable stoma. Um, Short-term use was defined as two to four weeks, long-term greater than 30 days. You know, Frederick Foley in the 1930s, he was a urologist in the Midwest, and he's the one that developed the retention balloon. Uh, catheters for draining the bladder have been around forever, um, way, way back in Roman times, even before that. But he was the one that was able to develop that the balloon stays, it keeps that catheter in place. Uh, and actually he developed it, he was a big inventor, he developed a lot of things. And he developed it for use post-prostatectomy for two days. Um, what's happened in the U.S. is we've seen long-term use, and that's defined as greater than 30 days. And we refer to it all the time as a Foley. You'll see nurses, especially in the hospital. We're trying to get away from that and just call it an IUC, indwelling urinary catheter. There are two roots, uh, methods of insertion. A lot of us in urology um, see suprapubic, and actually we are the ones that um, once they come out of surgery for at least the first six weeks, we actually change these suprapubics with guide wires and console tips. So it's a very common practice in urology. Uh, we are seeing more use of conversion to suprapubic with the fact that we have so many um, individuals in the U.S. that have spinal cord injury, and sometimes that's a better option than their current management. So actually we're seeing an increase of suprapubic use. That is an outpatient surgery that's done. Um, Howard may talk more about that in his lecture, but mostly what we tend to see is urethral insertion. Um, what's changed a lot in the past several years, and I do quite a bit of lecturing in the United States, and I cannot believe that no one knows of this guideline. I don't, I don't know how many in the, in the room know of this guideline that came out. Yeah, see, very few. And actually, it's very landmark. You know, I've been in this field since 86, and I used to always quote the CDC guideline from 1983. We didn't have any updated guideline on the use of indwelling catheters in, in the United States and really around the world as far as how long they stay in, uh, what is care of them. And actually, um, the CDC combined with the infectious disease 
um, group in the United States, and now it's become part of um, the European guidelines looking at um, prevention of catheter-associated UTIs. And it's a really great document. You can find it online, and it really has changed practice in our country. And I, I, I think it's, a, it's an evidence-based document. Um, we were quite involved with it because actually Carolyn Good was a resident at our hospital. I'm sure it's Craig, who's an internal medicine, and the head of this guideline was our chief medical officer. So at the University of Pennsylvania, we kind of lived this guideline since 19, uh, since 2007. It was released in 2009. So what is going on now with catheters? And I always find when I talk to international audiences, you kind of look at me strange because you guys haven't used them. Well, you know, as much as we have in the U.S. In the U.S., we've used them basically because it's financial. Um, in home care, you got a visit every month with a patient to change the catheter, so it was a source of revenues. And I remember in the early 1990s when I tried to talk to home health agencies us who were doing home care as far as a protocol to remove catheters as soon as possible, the chief financial officer didn't want me to come back because that was a source of their visits, so that was a source of revenues. And um, what's happened now, the whole, the whole view of these have been changed because of the fact that they've attached these indwelling catheters to the increase in nosocomial infections, but also antibiotic resistance, which is a major global issue. Okay, so the point is, is that you see more and more studies on what is going on with these catheters. And basically, this is a really great study, and, and uh, if you ever want to uh, look up someone who's done a lot of work in this area, Sanjay Sant, and he actually has a video which is really kind of nice that he did for the CDC. But he's in Michigan, and he's written a lot about the misuse of these devices. But uh, with practice guidelines, um, it was deemed that 31% of patients in acute care, and this is mostly based in the U.S., although you are now seeing the same data coming out of Asia, out of Europe, everywhere, South America, the, the publications on this is only increasing. And as you can see, which I think is kind of astounding, the attending physician in the hospital, so he's the one in charge of the patient, uh, almost 40% uh, did not know their patient had a catheter, residents, interns, and medical students. So who do you think really does handle these catheters? Nurses. Yeah. You know. Even though in our country you have to order them, the doctor has to order them. So there's a lot of inappropriate reasons. And the one I think that's really important that I hear all the time from my nurses is the fact of this. It's convenient for the nurse, especially for someone who has incontinence um, uh, or someone who needs help toileting. It's just much easier to have that catheter in. It doesn't take the time to get them out of bed, get them to the bathroom, or they don't have to change a product. So I think that this is really important to understand. And again, this is what has been in the literature as far as looking at what staff has done. And this is what the guideline says is an inappropriate use for an indwelling catheter. Now, this again is by Sanjay Sant, and this is, I think, one of the most excellent references. Um, and he actually, it's a patient perspective, and he calls the uh, catheter, indwelling catheter, a form of a restraint in the sense that it restrains the patient from movement. Um, it does, they do cause pain. I mean, as nurses, we tend to be the ones putting them in, but they are painful. If any of you have had a catheter in this room, you know it is uncomfortable, especially when you move. But basically, patients report they're uncomfortable, they're painful, and they restrict daily activities. So his point was, it's a restraint because it can, can increase the chance of pressure ulcers and venous thromboembolism. And that's a really important issue as far as in the hospital with the postoperative patients. So that's really, I think, um, and really there's very few to none um, publications on patient perspective, and this is one that was done in 2002. Complications are there. I'm just going to run through these. Um, basically. Um, these things do have complications, and why? Because they're indwelling. So you're going to see this is a much higher than whenever I go over um, um, intermittent catheterization or external. Um, the number ones is catheter-associated UTI, bacteria, ca um, caudies, and then urosepsis, and this is a major issue. Uh, obstruction and blockage occurs. We now have a lot more information about biofilms. Urethral damage, arthritis, stricture, false passage, and again, that's mostly in men because of the long urethra. We had a discussion about that at dinner the other night, right, about the length of the urethra, huh? Um, I guess some guys didn't understand why males and females have different sized catheters. Um, urine leakage or bypassing around the catheter and then expulsion of the catheter. The last two complications are seen a lot long term, where actually the patient has uh, pulled the catheter out with a balloon intact. 
Um, or as a nurse, and I'm an old nurse, I started in the 70s, I, I have many times transferred a patient with a catheter where I'm transferring the patient and the bag is on the other side of the bed, right? Uh, some of you are shaking your hand, I admit to it, all right? And what does that do? That tugs and that can cause problems or that can pull the catheter out. So the issue is that um, these complications are there and I wanna I'll walk you through a few of them. Okay, so CAUTIs. Um, this is um, really data that, I mean, it's unrefutable. I pulled up in Pennsylvania. We now, in the United States, have to track, if it's a volunteer tracking, but most hospitals are doing it, um, that how many CAUTIs you have and how many hospital-acquired infections there are, and we actually have them online, so you could look this up. So in 2009, 70 to 75% of all hospital-acquired infections were attributed to an indwelling urinary catheter, and that's kind of unbelievable because that's a major issue where we see MRSA and versa, and we really don't have antibiotics to treat. 50% of spinal cord men or women performing intermittent cath develop bacteria, uh, and that's um, out of uh, Nicole, who's written a lot in 2012, but there's a low prevalence of UTIs in men with an external catheter. Now, I have it up there, but you see that publication. There's very little on externals. Um, I, you know, we don't use them a lot in the U.S., um, the group that uses them is the VA system, and I always say the VA, the vets in the United States have different penises because they're the only group that uses them, I guess. For some reason, they're really a nursing application, and nurses don't feel comfortable applying them. But um, so there's very, actually very little evidence um, on the use of externals, although what's happening in acute care is because we are taking out indwellings, we're seeing more and more of a use. And I, you know, one unit, which is the neuro unit, one of the studies I did was um, I tracked Foley catheters, and I have to publish this data, but so I went around to look at whether they, uh, they met all the criteria for nursing care. So what was really crazy is I would go on the unit, and they didn't know who had the catheter. So how I found out someone had a catheter is I would go in the room and look for the bag. On one unit, I did that, and I traced it up, and they were externals. So that unit had three externals, and this was 2010. So I went to the, the, the head of that unit, and I said, you know, I'm really impressed your nurses are using externals. Um, I'd like to write up a few case studies. And no one wanted to do it. Yeah, so we really need more of that, of their use. There's a, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to externals, because I think that this is a viable option in men. Um, the whole field has moved to biofilm. And biofilms, um, one of the best lectures I ever heard was actually at the AUA years ago, um, and it was by a dentist. He, they were the first one to mention biofilms, and you can see those teeth, they look kind of cruddy, okay? And basically, he saw them on teeth, thought infection, gave them antibiotics, and they didn't go away, and the only way he got rid of them was by scraping it. And we now realize that biofilms are everywhere, and it's really costing millions, it's killing millions, NIH has stated that it um, is, is the cause of 80% of all infections that we see, and industry, it's costing industry billions of dollars. But not only in the body, it's contaminating water pipes and food surfaces. So this is our future, biofilms. I'm sure that the, um, the new meds that are going to come out are going to be anti-biofilms. And, you know, we see it in gum disease, venous catheter, so it's any type of catheter that's in. We now have stents that are coated because of that reason. Um, we see implant contamination with the hips, and then, of course, with the urinary catheters, we now realize obstruction uh, is um, basically um, secondary to biofilm colony communities um, developing. We see them in diabetic wounds. We see them in burns. So basically, biofilm is is really the new, the new um, problem with all kinds of devices. And these are just pictures. I have so many of these pictures. And, um, you know, this looks like a worm, but that really is a biofilm. You can see the crust here. If you look, cut a, I, I cut my catheters in half. You should do that. Um, there's, you know, um, and it's really their hard crystal-like um, sediment, okay? It's what we used to call the obstruction of the catheter and crustaceans, but actually the biofilms. And they multiply every 20 seconds. Um, and, you know, I get asked all the time, well, which indwelling catheters are worse? Well, if you look at the guidelines, um, you know, there's some belief that a, sil a silicone catheter um, is more thin-walled, so the attachment of the biofilms may be less. In the U.S., we're having a real issue with latex allergies, and a lot of health systems are moving towards latex-free. Yeah. 
And no matter what, you know, I had an argument with one of their catheter companies who's telling me, but I have, we have a new bonded latex. And I said, unless you can say that catheter is latex free, we had a one, um, uh, $1 million case against our health system. So I think we're going to go latex free because we didn't pick up latex uh, allergy. And it wasn't so much a catheter as gloves and all that. You know, I don't know about you, but we use the purple nitrate gloves now. We don't use latex anywhere. And in urology, we are really latex heavy, heavy aren't we, with all the different products we have. Um, I think red rubber, of course, is going to go away, which is an issue with urology. I'd like to hear Howard's comment, because in urology, red rubber catheters are a bigger coup day, But I, they're going to go away because of the fact of the latex. And that's actually been the basis of a lot of uh, our use in urology. Um, when I tell my urologist that, they just think I'm crazy. And I said, but I'm telling you that if the hospital goes latex-free, all this stuff is going to, what is the substitute for it? Where's the new innovations? Who's in this room going to invent the next one? So I think we need that. Um, the silicone, there's a lot of controversy on that. Um, you know, the feeling is um, short-term, that might be better. But again, short-term is a couple days. It may be more protective against CAUTIs, but we don't have really solid data. But I do think there'll be more growth in that area. So what we know, we know that biofilms rapidly colonize the catheter. And again, it can also be an intermittent catheters, catheter. And you know, I know there's a big debate about reuse versus single use of intermittent catheters. And I'm not going to discuss that in this lecture. But the issue is there are, there are probably are biofilms. There's no techniques that's been shown to clean that intermittent catheter that may re um, get rid of the biofilms. And in the US, I have patients who wash, uh, were, were, before we changed our whole reimbursement in the US, which was in 2007, uh, they would tell me, oh, Diane, I, I would uh, I just wipe it with my mouth, the catheter. There was no standard cleaning technique. And now we do single use, and I don't really see that changing. Um, current materials and design give little advantage. Biofilm defense against host attack and antimicrobial agents. You just cannot get rid of these biofilms with antibiotics. And uh, there are uropathogenic E. coli. We now call that UPEC is what uh, we know it's a form of E. coli, but it's, you know, not the one that we're hitting with the antibiotics. It's linked to inflammatory response, to studies within the bladder, and we really need new strategies. The only way to get rid of a biofilm was change the device is really what we're still saying now. All right, now, when we talk about prevention, this still holds true no matter what you look at or what data, hand washing. Um, hand washing has been shown to be the best prevention. And what we're going to start doing in the US is a little chip that's going to be on our clothes that rings when we don't go into a room and wash our hands. Um, you know, I have, a, uh, I have had patients say they're, they're aghast when they see doctors come in and they don't wash their hands. Um, we now um, are going to be probably, our pay is going to be attached to washing our hands. And there's new technology that literally um, will, you'll light up if you haven't done it. So that's where we're going because this has been shown to be, with all infections, to be the best prevention. And when you look at this data, it's actually the uh, alcohol hand rubs as opposed to washing with wash and, um, soap and water because to really get the um, bacteria off, you have to do it for a period of time. And one of the things we do in our hospital when we bring new staff in, whether it be a nursing aide or an RN, is we do kind of a course about that. And what they'll do is they'll wash your hands and then they turn the lights out. And the gr they'll show green on your hands of what was did not come off and all these people's hands are green, even though they stood there and washed their hands. So they do a whole um, kind of class with that and say, see, you're not doing it enough. You need to use the alcohol rubs. This is a big issue because if you use the alcohol rubs long term, you lose your um, fingerprint. That's been a big issue actually in the VA system. And the other problem is I have a real issue with it because they're alcohol based and I cough. So I come in the room, I do that with my hands, and then I sit and cough for like five minutes in front of the patient. It's a real issue, but it is the best way to clean, clean your hands. For some reason, the alcohol gets in my throat. And, but the point is, is that um, it's going to now be tracked as far as if you're a healthcare professional. Uh, and this is a nice study, and this looked at, um, and this is a, a, a fairly recent, well, it's from the 90s, but basically they looked at um, compliance with this, average compliance for ha ha um, hand washing at large teaching hospitals is 48%. So the nurse was better than the physician, but nursing assistant was pretty good. But you can see that, you know, compliance isn't there. Now, we've had no d new designs of IUCs now for a long time. And for you, probably have seen this if you went to any of the meetings in the past few years, this new catheter, which has two balloons. 
Um, there's not a research, really a lot of research on this, but the belief was who invented this was that possibly you'd have less trauma at the bladder neck um, with less pressure. Um, but I haven't really seen it come out as far as use in clinical practice. But they're really, and I just put this up because there's just been no new designs. Nothing really when you think about it since um, Dr. Foley, right? So it's a, a, you know, it's, I think we do need that. So if anybody's in the room going to invent something, I really encourage you to do it. Urethral trauma, we see this all the time in urology. I cannot tell me, this is, um, you know, all the way torn the urethra in men um, down to their pubic area. Um, we do so much repairs of these, uh, you know, and because we're a large tertiary center, we just see the worst. But, you know, and then we see necrotic areas. But the point is, on men long term, these are going to cause trauma and especially at the urethra. And that's why you talk about securement of the device, um, but the point is is that it really it's a tension on very uh, skin, and, and there's other feelings that it may be a response of the urethra between patients. It differs why some men get it and others don't. Immune system tries to attack the catheter and the bacteria in the biofilm, which may break down the tissue. And then again, latex has very high risk of scarring, so we're back to the issue of the make of the catheter again. Um, and, you know, um, this is kind of, kind of what you see, um, and there's it's a little bit of drainage there, but it's torn here. I always say it's like a Ziploc bag, or really a, a, a catheter-made hypospadias is sometimes what I call it. Uh, this is something that actually the, um, the CDC now has on their website that I put together after the guidelines came out. And basically it was for nurses in our hospital as far as what are the key areas that you must do. And number one is a tamper-resistant system. Now, this is nice because there's a red thing on there saying don't disconnect it. And the point is you should not disconnect the catheter. If you're going to irrigate, if there's irrigation going on, it's probably continuous bladder irrigation. And the issue is you should use a three-way Foley where you have another port for the irrigation. Securing the catheter, there's lots of them out there. You secure the catheter, not the whole thing. You don't need to secure the balloon port. It's the catheter, upper thigh. In the literature, they still say that um, Securing a male patient should be on the abdomen because you want to make sure the curves of the urethra are kind of the normal way it should be as opposed to pushing it to the side. I never see it done, but it's always written in the literature. Um, the fact that you don't let this bag um, have large amounts in it because bacteria travels outside the system. When you disconnect it, it can enter the system or from the urine up internally. It should be off the floor. Canisters labeled, this is a big uh, deal. Um, canisters labeled with uh, the date and what it's for because you have patients, especially in acute care, where you may have an NG tube, a chest tube, and they're recommending, or now, you know, rectal containment device that's draining, that you put the urinary away from the other ones so they're not contaminated. Drainage bag, when was it put in, by whom? And now we're putting where was it put in, the ER or whatever. And then the drainage bag should be below the level of the bed. So these are basically good um, um, indwelling urinary catheter uh, nursing practices. Okay, so that's indwelling. And um, I know that was a very short review, but you know, you'll hear more about it from my other um, speakers today. And um, basically, uh, there is now evidence that um, Sharon will talk about as far as where the guidelines are. Mary will talk about her exciting research as far as self-care. And it's really, when I listen to Mary, well, I'll talk about the fact of in the home, I'm thinking why they have the catheters in their home. But these are major problems, and people uh, live with these catheter, catheters for many years, uh, especially in the U.S. Again, I don't think that's so much so in, uh, outside the U.S., but it really is a major um, problem in the U.S. So let's go to intermittent. And I'm going down from the top catheter that has the most infection to the one that has less, and then we'll do, a, we'll do externals. So intermittent, again, is um, sometimes just called in and out catheterization, straight catheterization, but basically it doesn't stay in. Okay, you drain the bladder and you remove it. So right there you don't have something staying in the bladder that can cause problems long term because you have no root into it, right? Doesn't mean that they can't cause infection, but the point is it's not an indwelling device. Um, now, why does this work? And this is all theoretical, and actually this comes from Lapides, and I'll talk a little bit about Lapides, who was a urologist at the University of Michigan in, in the 1970s who coined the term clean technique. But basically it reduces intravesical pressure 
if you have to keep the bladder empty, which makes sense. No urine's in there, so it reduces the pressure. And it improves blood circulation in the bladder wall, making the bladder mucous membrane more resistant to infectious disease. Um, you know, uh, Howard and I were on the AUA uh, white paper um, for prevention of clotties, and that was really kind of asked, where's the evidence of that, right? Uh, Howard, is, is there really evidence to say that? And there isn't, but that was a feeling in the 70s of why intermittent may have less infections. Again, we're not sure. And what are the indications? Urinary retention, of course, incomplete bladder emptying. I will tell you that in the U.S., we have the highest spinal cord injury population next to Iraq and Afghanistan because of the wars. So we have men, uh, no, not the wars, and the gunshots, and gunshots, there were so many um, gunshot accidents we have in the U.S. or accidents are, are intentional. So we have a lot of um, patients doing intermittent catheterization in the U.S. Um, it is the preferred technique, but we have a huge population. Um, so, and most of it's male, all right, and really we're seeing these individuals um, live longer and longer term. So, you know, Catherine Moore and her group, uh, Mandy Fader, um, came out with a Cochrane review looking at what evidence is there, and there is really no evidence, whether sterile, aseptic, or clean. I have to tell you, I learned something two years ago when someone explained to me what is called clean and aseptic and sterile. Because in the U.S., we use sterile and aseptic similar. Okay, so I found that to be interesting. Um, or clean, what is clean. And, you know, I, I really uh, tell, clean was coined by Lapides. Go back and read his article. He looked at like six or eight women. He had them wash the catheter with soap and water. Okay. Uh, and what he talks about is the fact that they uh, did not, uh, no, no, not soap and water, with an antibacterial, some type of sidal thing, which I know nowadays we would never be able to use in patients because it probably causes cancer or something, to soak the catheter in. No gloves, his whole point with clean was no gloves, and you didn't have to do sterile wiping of the perineum. And out of his research, I think two of them got infections. One dropped the catheter on the floor and used it, and the other one I think didn't cath as often. So that became clean technique, and you know, this is, I know, a very hot topic. I know that um, um, Andy Fader's doing the multi-cath study, but I have to tell you, in the U.S. in 2007, the VA um, came out with uh, single-use catheters, and because the, the catheter is defined by our FDA as uh, one-time use, we now only use them one term, time. So for us to go back to reuse, with the um, legal issues and the malpractice in the U.S., we would have to get the manufacturers to state that those are, can be reused. And then they're going to have the liability. So I don't really see that changing, but I do know that, you know, single use, um, it does increase costs in that, but that to me is a done deal. So I'm not sure where, where we're going to see changes unless, I guess you have a lot more research on it. But to move our federal government is really difficult, and who knows who will be president next. Um, catheter type, coded or uncoded. We have kind of know that the coding with the antibiotic for intermittent catheterization probably is not good. The feeling is most of it's been with a nitrofuritin coding. We feel that that may cause um, resistance to uh, a common antibiotic we use, right? And that it's felt that it may come off over time. Uh, method, single use or multiple use, I already addressed that, and then the person, whether it's a self or another person doing it. So basically, these are the definitions, and I pulled them out of the EAUN uh, publication, which I think is an excellent publication. So the sterile, as I said, um, is what is defined here, aseptic, um, and I th it's interesting, I, I, we kind of never looked at the differences between these two, but I, this is what's come out. So. Um, you know, to me, this is really what's done in institutions, so I'm not sure, you know, quite what the difference is here. Um, as far as using a non-lubricated or using external hydrophilic, when we do it in institutions, we are not using hydrophilic catheters, we're using straight catheters where we apply the gel. Um, when you talk about no touch, that came out years ago. Um, and basically, it's a um, protective sleeve, or as you can see with this one, it's a little um, protective um, kind of glide. But I have to tell you, recently took out uh, from the bladder in cystoscopy one of these glides. Yes. Okay. So just so you know that. Um, and um, uh, we also took out a catheter for in a woman 
the short ones that had no funnel like this at the end. Everybody wants to get rid of those funnels. Well, it went totally into her bladder, and um, she didn't realize it. I don't know how she didn't realize it. But when she kept having infections and then started to have pain, and we did cysto, it was sitting in the bladder. So you have to, you know, these types of issues with designs and people come out with, I was, you know, I, I know there's a couple of people here that I've talked with already at this meeting, and I said, some of what I see is happening is that we keep listening to these patients, and we should listen to the patients. But, and I know that they want to live normal lives. And in the U.S., we have so many more spinal cord injury patients that are out there. You see them on the street now, going on buses and all that. It's so much more different than years ago. And they want to be able to put the catheter in their pocket. Um, they want the easy catheter. And I keep saying, are we getting so much for convenience to the patient that we're losing the concept of safety? And I think that that has to be thought of whenever we're designing, and I'm not sure. And I know you keep hearing from the patient, we want it easy, we want it small, we want it to look like a lipstick, we want it to be, have it folded up as I can put it in my pocket. But is that going to affect the patient's safety of that use? And I'm not sure that's always being thought of as far as whenever we, um, whenever these catheters come out. And I don't really think nurses are really thinking about that um, as much as they should be. And then the cling single use is basically um, um, you may not touch the catheter, um, it, it may not have a protective sleeve or collection bag, and you dispose of it afterwards, so it becomes sterile. So um, those are the different types, and that's the guidelines in the EAUN that, you know, definitions you can use. And then reuse, and like I said, um, I, I just don't see it done anymore. I, I cannot believe how quickly we've changed that in the United States. I, if I had stood here uh, about, a, you know, five, six years ago, I said that would never happen. And what happened in 2007, the VA came out with the fact that um, the nurses in the VA Veterans Administration system in the U.S., which, by the way, the VA system is the largest provider in the U.S., um, stated that um, nurses and clini clinicians could no longer recommend reuse of catheters. Um, and um, in 2008, so they would pay for single catheters. And then in 2008, our major insurer, Medicare, which is an um, insurer of the elderly and, and disabled, came out saying they would cover 200 a month, which was single use. And um, I went and, and I had a handout that had a nice little discussion of how to clean your catheter, which was not based on anything, any evidence, okay, but something that we concocted from everything I read, okay. Um, and the thing is, is that um, my, our legal department said you cannot recommend that anymore, take that off you must do single use. That's what the, that was approved by the FDA and, and you can't go in against that. So now we really just see single use catheters. Um, we're not really reusing at all. There may be some slight differences in some insurers, but it's really not the case anymore, is that we're using. And I don't think this will turn. The biggest debate in the United States is who got the VA to do that? And I don't really know, although I hear it may have been patient groups and that, but um, it really is a big change. Some, uh, some of the concern, again, is about antibiotic use and infections. Um, and I'll give you a side thing. I'm doing a study right now with a company, and um, someone in the company made a very good comment, um, and we're looking at reuse, and it's been difficult for me to find anybody reusing in Philadelphia. But sh what we're shocked by is a number of individuals I have screened who are reusing who are on antibiotics for no reason, and they're excluded from the study. I know. It's really disturbing. I, I kind of am in urology, and we're so easy to prescribe them. But yeah, and um, they're reusing the catheter. They may not have a UTI. They may have had a UTI, but they're taking antibiotics. Yeah. So uh, here's the EAU guidelines on neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction. And you can see that gold standards is intermittent compared to clean aseptic provides significant benefit in reducing the potential for contamination. Um, Pre-lubricated, and again, these are all different terms, and you can see that the, now we have the short catheters, we have speedy catheters, which is a very nice catheter. We now have little tiny catheters for women, um, shorter length for women. And there's advantages and disadvantages for all these, and, and there's really quite a bit of literature now on hydrophilic. Um, I have to tell you, a lot of it's industry sponsored, but I think it's really given us a lot of information, because I don't know who else is going to fund this, these kinds of um, research. But, you know, hydrophilic, there is no question. I teach patients all the time, and I have to tell you that they tell me it's easier to put it in. It doesn't hurt, especially men. There's some data to show it decreases urethral stricture. The longer you do intermittent cath, the increased risk of stricture. 
So it protects that urethra. Disadvantage, I also have men who come in and say, Diane, I waste so many catheters because they fall on the floor because they're so slippery. Um, well, they, are, they can be messy depending on what the type of catheter is. And I live in an inner, uh, my practice is in an inner city, and I always say in Philadelphia, people reuse everything because I have a high engine population. And they will reuse these. Well, they, these are not good for that because they stick. And the other thing sometimes, I recently had a batch of a, a company's catheters, and I had two different patients who were using these catheters call me and saying they were sticking. So I think in transport or how they were made, they dried out. And um, they were really worried about. So there's issues as far as a disadvantage. Of course, these are one-time use. But the point is they have a substance that makes a smooth layer of water that stays during insertion. And that's what hydrophilic. Now, um, this is um, Diana Car Cardenas, who's down in Miami. She does the Miami Project for Paralysis. Uh, she um, did this study where she looked at 56 um, subjects enrolled, 45 completed. This was done in 2009, was published, eight, greater than 50% men, 22 in the treatment group, hydrophilic, 23 in the control, and basically same number of symptomatic UTIs in both groups. Um, but however, the number of symptomatic UTIs that required antibiotics was significantly lower, smaller in the group, the treatment group than the control. So those in the hydrophilic had less antibiotics prescribed than the other. 70% of the control group had at least one antibiotic treatment episode compared with 50% in the hydrophilic. Uh, females had increased risk, which is not, not, is not surprising, okay? Uh, we need more research like this. I think we need on bigger numbers than that, so. Now, gel, um, gel pre-lubricated, um, basically we used to call these no-touch, but the concept is, is the gel is uh, at the top here. Um, you um, insert the catheter through that introducer there, and there's gel, so it gets gelled, so nothing is touched. Um, and these can be really nice catheters, um, especially sometimes with my patients who I see smoking over their catheter or whatever, you know, it's not a very clean catheterization. Um, so, you know, I always say to nurses, you know, you're in your office, you're doing a, maybe on an exam table, you know, you're probably wearing gloves, everything's probably fairly clean, and then they go home and do it wherever they want, or as my one patient says, oh, I cath myself in the car while I'm driving. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, you're a man, I guess you can do that. You pull off, oh, yeah, Diane's real easy. Well, we put our makeup on, we eat as we're driving, so, I mean, come on. We text, I mean, it's ridiculous. But the thing is, is that, you know, so the concept of no touch, these tend to be latex free, 100%. Uh, pre lubricated catheter and especially in this guide mechanism. I don't know if I have this slide set, but um, the issue as far as putting in the tip here to bypass the first part of the urethra. I, I know companies are making these, but I don't think any patient's really using them. And there's a lot of different systems out there. Okay, so we have really lots of them to choose from. And you know, I we try a lot of them. It's, it's astounding to me. It's almost like um, the erectile dysfunction medications. One works for one man and it doesn't work for another. I mean, it's the same thing with these catheters. And I have them try different ones that's so what's most convenient for them. And then also who's doing the catheter catheterizing? Is it the patient, is it the, um, is it the parent, or is it the spouse or whoever? And what's most convenient for them? And is it male or female? Uh, this was a study that was published in 2005 that looked at the no-touch no method reducing bac bacteria. And they use a lot of different ca catheters of which I have to tell you some of these are not I can't translate them into what we use in the U.S., but basically looking at which one had less um, CFUs um, and basically E and F are the ones, and there was a two Hollister, and I think this became the Vapro. Um, but you know, again, these are industry-supported studies, and I think we need to come out with um, some bigger studies on this. I don't know really, besides Mary, anyone doing catheter studies in the U.S. Um, through NIH or anything. I think there'd be a lot of interest, but I think it's a difficult area. I will tell you that whenever we came out with single-use catheters, uh, urologists were real upset. They didn't realize that was happening. I don't know if, Howard, you were aware of that when that happened, but my urologists were blown away by it, and they were really upset that they weren't consulted on the fact of going from reuse to single use. What? I, I was like in the dark. I yeah. Didn't know about it until it was already happening. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, yeah, he, I don't know if you heard him. He said he, he's a urologist. He's in Chicago, um, Chicago, no, Cleveland Clinic. And he said um, he didn't know what was happening. It's exactly what all my urologists say. And, um, but the issue is, is that, yeah, it was a regulatory thing. And, you know, I, I, you know whether you agree with it or not, 
I mean, it's something that I, you know, in the U.S. I don't think it's going to change soon. Now, complications, as you can see, are very similar to what I just showed you with indwelling, but they're slightly different. This is less, but it can happen. Urethral damage, uh, we don't see tearing as much as we see stricture from inserting that catheter over time. So the longer you're going to perform intermittent cath, the more chance, risk, increased risk of stricture. False passage, and we do see all of this in men. More women, we really don't. Epididymitis from infections, bladder stones, and the bladder stones are from introduced pubic hair. And that's why you really want um, patients to trim their hair, not shave it, trim it. Pain, hematuria, that's sometimes a sign of infection. And then bladder stones, which are growing around the introduced, I said that twice, introduced pubic hair. So something to remember. Uh, we do see strictures. Um, and basically, um, this is actually, um, as of in two months, the core curriculum for urologic nursing will come out in the U.S., and we have lots of pictures like this. But a stricture can occur along any of this area here. Here's more of a um, uh, meatal stenosis. And basically, is that it's an inflammatory response to repeated catheterization, risk increases with the number of years in IC. And uh, hydrophilic catheters may decrease... Um, the incidents, and I don't, I don't know. We don't know, but that's the feeling as they may. And it's only because it passes so smoothly, you don't traumatize the urethra. You know, one thing I think that, that most of us don't realize is that when we catheterize someone, what are we doing to the urethra? We're dilating it. Okay, because the urethra, what size French is the urethra? Howard. What, do you, what size French is the urethra? Somebody told me 10, maybe 10 French? 8, 10, right? It's, it's like, a, I always say, it's like a cooked spaghetti noodle, um, number 11, angel hair. So, and it has peristalsis, right? It's very dispensable. But it is, okay, but continually should it be dispensable? I mean, when the urine comes out, it doesn't, right? But over time, there's scarring, bleeding can occur in that. So the issue is you can understand why this can occur over years. Um, ideal successful patient, unobstructed urethra, of course, good vision, good perineal hygiene, compliant, able, ability to perform self-care. So one of the things, can they address or transfer? And that's probably a key. This is a big issue in the U.S. I have so many patients who have obesity or large abdominal girths where they cannot get around the girth in a female to access the urethra, or the man cannot see the tip of his penis over his girth. And I have taught them in front of mirrors, okay? This is a major issue. Um, women who MS have abductor spasms and they can't separate their legs, that's also an issue. I think females are more challenging. So the issue is, you know, um, teaching them. We do a lot of pictures in that. They should hold the penis upright. But I have to tell you, I um, put this in one of my books, and I was, it, my co-authors were urologists, and they told me this one. And they told me, Diane, it looks like he's masturbating. We're not putting that in the book. I said, no, he's holding his penis up so he can't put the catheter in. But seriously, you know, the point is, is that she's showing them pictures of what they should do. And sometimes with older men who have retracted penises, they're pushing the penis down, the urethra down, right? And they're really not getting it really into um, the urethra at a good angle. So they have S curves, and you want to make sure that they pull that out. And then women, I think, can be difficult because our urinary meatus is somewhat hidden. Um, there's a lot of AIDS out, out there, and I've seen more and more as I come to Europe. You guys are great with these AIDS. We don't have a lot of these available in the U.S. Sometimes my patients find them on the Internet. None of my patients look like this. My, my old ladies can't put their leg on the toilet seat. They fall over, okay? One thing I always recommend is that if you teach a patient, make sure they come back several times, and then I have them show me. I take men into our bathrooms in our department and say, show me how you're doing it. And women, and you know, I, I, you know, I spend my time, now remember, I put them on the exam table, I separate their legs, I show them a picture of the urethra. Who does that at home? Right? And in the U.S., you only get seven to ten minutes with the patient, so you've got to do all that. And you do it well, you guide their hand, right? I always say, well, I teach my patients with a mirror. I said, okay, my, hand, my right hand has a catheter, my left hand has separate my labia, my third hand has the mirror, I guess. You know, where do you put the mirror, right? And the issue is I've had men, women come back and say to me, and I'll say, show me how you're doing it. Well, Diane, I stand there and I poke and poke and poke until I get it. Well, if they don't have UTIs, they're poking their themselves and their own bacteria, I think that's okay. But the point is demonstrate how they're doing it, and maybe there's some cues you can give them as far as doing it correctly. Um, let's go now to external, and then I'll be done. 
Uh, and these are pictures of my patients. Look at this one. You know, I get so embarrassed when a patient comes in and they found something and who knows what this is. Um, and he's keeping it on, you see, with um, gauze and everything. And or this guy found this on the internet. Uh, he was a post prostatectomy. That's an uh, McGuire. And my surgeons and their nurse practitioners and PAs, and we have a big staff, did not recommend it. I see this almost once a week. And the thing is, is that they're out there. They'll find it. I find men do not want to put up with any leakage. They don't really like um, the absorbent products. They're not used to using them, so they don't want to. And that these are really um, collection devices. Now, we, you're hearing the term male external catheters, but, and, but a lot of times most people don't use them. Use that. They'll call them Texas catheter or condom catheters. Okay, and so you got to be careful with a lot of um, staff who really is used to the older terms and always look at me and say, what are you talking about? But it is an external catheter. It's a common catheter, but don't use it for sex because there's a hole in the end. Um, it's secured to the skin, adhesive or straps, or they can be reusable. And it really is used for urinary incontinence, and it definitely is preferable to indwell urinary catheter. The problem is with these is really, and I think I have a picture, is right here. Nobody knows that you size it. And in our hospital, they buy two sizes, because I guess all the penises are two sizes. I don't know. And you know what, companies, none of your sizing stuff match. They all have different millimeters, huh? Yes, everybody? It's so nice with the Foley's and the intermittent where the funnel's the same, right? We all know that 14 French is color green. Why this is, I don't know. It would, it would be so helpful for the companies to get together and come out with standardized sizes for these. And I would love you to color code it because it works even better because you can really attach it. Because a lot of times i got to put now my glasses on to read the little print on the back of the condom. So, I mean, that would be a big help to this area. But you do have, usually most of them have about five sizes. Um, and that's the most important thing. Like you can see this one just falling off because he has the wrong size on. And they leak because of that. And then what happens? Oh, they don't work, Diane. They don't work. They just don't work. And that's what the nurses tell me. Those things don't work. Can I come over to your office? You have some really great ones there. Ours don't work. This is a story I tell all the time. This is years ago. I was in Indiana, and I was at a home health agency. And uh, we were talking about using lots of different devices, and I came talked about a male external catheter. And I said, um, I think this is something you could be using in your male patients in the home who have incontinence. And the nurses said, no, they won't buy them for us. They give us one size. So I said, well, let's meet with your purchasing person. So this very nice, attractive young girl comes in who purchases our other products. And I came up and I said, you know, listen, we need to have different sizes available for the nurses because they have to size, you know, the circumference. And she said, oh, no, there's just one size. Men in Indiana just have one size. And I have to tell you, I can go to probably five hospitals in Philadelphia that they'll say the same thing. Purchasing is someone who has no idea. It's either a cost issue, they have no idea what they're doing. And, I, and who should be educating them? Us, okay, who have that knowledge. And you do not see it happening. You know, one of the, my biggest beef is the urology nurse, as the consultant in acute care, is what needs to happen. Because we understand tubes, we understand catheters, and we need to educate them. And that's actually really what we do in, in our system. And the thing is, is that, um, and especially the new young ones, um, they really are not taught this in, in training. So I, I really feel very strongly about that. Now, complications, again, uh, you'll see these. And these are more external. We do see caudies with these, but they're much less. Not a lot of data on that. Maceration, irritation of the skin, secondary from friction of the catheter. Phimosis, you see this all the time where, you know, and, and the nurses will say, well, not, it's so difficult. You have an uncircumcised male. You're to roll the catheter over the foreskin. Instead, they pulled back the foreskin, rolled the catheter, and then it really basically the foreskin's strangulizing the uh, glands. And, and sometimes also I have patients, I have a patient kept it on with um, rubber bands and all that type of thing. Um, I'll tell you one more story real quick. Years ago I was the um, expert um, pr um, reviewer for Grand Rounds in Urology and then Joe Auslander, who's a geriatrician, who is really well known in the U.S. who does incontinence, was, doing, was on the geriatric side. 
So for Grand Rounds, what we do once a year is we bring urology residents and geriatric residents together and present cases. So, and I was discussant for the geriatric residents cases. So, and Joe was for the urology cases. So a guy gets up and says, you know, 82 year old man who was widowed five months ago um, comes in with urethral discharge. Goes through his history, all these problems, you know, somewhat depressed, still grieving over the death of his wife, blah, blah, blah. They go to the physical exam. They pull back the foreskin and there's an embedded rubber band in the foreskin. So what was the cause of the urethral discharge? It's basically strangulated the urethra and he had an infection. They asked him, he had no recollection of why that rubber band was there. So um, what is it? So of course I raised my hand. I said, oh, he probably was keeping on either a condom catheter or something to hold it on place on his penis. And the geriatric resident's whole face fell. How did you figure that out? It took us three visits to figure out why that was there. So the issue is, is that I've seen duct tape they've kept this on with, these with, and the concept is really is that these need proper education in application. And I, and I think in nursing, I think we are, you know, remiss. And I had to tell you, I've never seen any of my urologists put on a condom catheter. I don't know, Howard, if you want to talk about that later. But I've never, have you put one on? No, no, I won't get you like that. But we have all different types. Again, I like the fact that, you know, again, um, they're coming up with the colors, but I wish everybody would standardize their colors. I think that would help a lot. And then, of course, um, use a sizing guide, uh, condition the skin, dexterity, can they apply it? That's probably one of the biggest negatives that why patients don't use these is they cannot apply, especially the elder population. And I find spouses will not help men, uh, their husbands do it. This is what you see. This is one of my patients. You can see how tight these bands are around his leg and you can see the urine's just pulling there. He has a silicone catheter on and, and um, you know, the nice one now by Coloplast, it's horizontal, I really like. But you can see that at some point th this ain't gonna work. And also there's urine sitting there. What do you think is gonna happen? You know, it can descend up and he get infected. So you really want to make sure they're applied. There's lots as far as reusable. This is a nice one for guys at golf who don't have a lot of incontinence, but they're all over the place. The Liberty pouch is really neat for guys who have retracted penises because it goes on the glands. I have men who travel on airplanes and that use um, this system, so there's lots of different ones out there. As far as research, the only one I've come up with was in 2010. Um, we looked at the optimal urosheath versus absorbent products, and again, um, they found, the, these men found that the urosheath was better, except for ease of use. Okay, so there's some, you know, we're just getting a little bit more research. It'd be nice and more research on this area. Patient preference, again, um, was uh, the sheath. Uh, and I think this just shows, which I think we know in practice, men don't want to use absorbent products. Um, there are these, and we're seeing more of these used, these external uh, collection pouches. Um, this is actually one of my patients years ago, years ago. This was a home care patient who did not move. She was comatose. Her elderly 90-year-old um, husband was caring for her. The act of changing absorbent products was basically killing him. They had a very nice nursing aide, and I taught her how to apply this. This woman, she didn't move now, had this in place for three days, and then he would put absorbent products on her the rest of the time. So this helped him with caregiving. I think that this, we need more of this. I'd like to see more... Um, development of this. And, uh, and you know, well, these are basically off of ostomy pouches, right, or, or uh, colostomy pouches. But I think that I know our anatomy is different, but someone has to come up with something, because I do think there's a huge market for uh, an external pouch for women. Okay. Thank you. Now, our next speaker is going to be Sharon, and she's going to talk um, and give us a lot more information on the current guidelines in this area.